UW 360 is proudly supported by BECU, a not-for-profit, member-owned credit union. Pacific Office Automation, copy, print, workflow, and IT, problem solved. Hi, I'm Samantha Rund, and this is UW360. In this episode, we'll show you breakthrough technology that reveals what's going on in a baby's brain. Check out a student art exhibit, hear from an attorney who spent 30 years working for Native American rights, and follow a young woman who's a student teacher in one of Seattle's high-need schools. But first, let me talk about where we are right now. This is William H. Gates Hall, home of the UW School of Law. Mr. Gates, a 1950 graduate of the school, once said that law is human service of the highest order. Our role as lawyers is to make it possible for people to survive and thrive in an extraordinarily complex world. It's a way of thinking embraced by the law school and practiced both in the way students are encouraged to think about the law and in the opportunities they're offered to be of service to the community. One such service is the Innocence Project Northwest. How do I prove that I'm innocent? There's no way they can find me guilty of this crime. I don't know, I didn't do it, I got the wrong guy. Ted, James, Allen, all are members of a club no one wants to join. Innocent people convicted of crimes. It really can be anybody who's caught up in a wrongful conviction. There are cases of police officers, uh, postal workers, who have been wrongfully convicted and, and in one case, in some cases, he's been sentenced to death for crimes that they did not commit. In 1996, Ted Bradford was accused of burglary and rape. He didn't do it, but during the stress and confusion of questioning by police, he confessed. I've heard from people saying, you know, I would never confess to something I didn't do. I don't care if they beat me or what they did. And it's just, they don't, I don't think they really could say that unless they've been in that situation. It was, you know, nine hours of interrogation. It's them, you know, hovering over you, invading your personal space, uh, yelling at you, alternating between yelling and then talking and then going back and forth. And you're just, your mind is just being bounced back and forth. You know, into, you know, they're trying to break you down. But a person who's innocent, like Ted was, thinks that they're going to be able to get out of this. They're going to be able to talk to the police and the police will understand and they'll be able to explain that they're innocent and that the system will work. During the investigation and the trial, Ted was living a nightmare. After being convicted and sent to prison, it was more like hell. But when you're innocent, you know, you wake up every day and that's the first thing you think of is, it wasn't a dream, this is reality. I'm actually in here. It's really hard to face that uh, day in and day out, knowing that you should not be there, especially when it, you know, goes on year after year. No one knows how many innocent people are in American prisons, but it could be thousands. Jackie McMurtry, an attorney and professor at the UW School of Law, is dedicated to reducing that number. In 1997, inspired by the work of Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, as well as her own experience defending clients, she started the Innocence Project Northwest. It began as a volunteer effort at the law school. We started without really any kind of strategic plan or any funding, um, just with the notion that these kinds of cases occur and that when they occur in the Northwest and specifically in Washington State, there should be an organized effort to remedy those miscarriages of justice. Today, the Innocence Project Northwest is part of the law school's curriculum. Students and faculty collaborate to win freedom for those who should never have been imprisoned. Our main mission here at the law school is to be leaders for the global common good. We believe that society really needs lawyers to be ethical leaders, to point the direction toward peace and justice, to really be the kind of leaders that can make the world a better place. And so Jackie's Innocence Project um, and the work that she and her students have done fits squarely in that. 
In the law school's clinics, students research cases and re-examine evidence, from DNA testing to witness statements to overlooked facts. For example, James Anderson had been convicted of robbery and sentenced to 17 years. He'd served four when he contacted the Innocence Project Northwest. A law student found records from California that proved James was actually not in Washington State at the time of the robbery. He was released on Christmas Eve 2008. I was praying and God sent me an angel to help me, Jackie. I've been doing all right, you know. Uh, I got married. I got uh, my first child due next month. And um, I'm glad I have my freedom, you know. In many cases, investigators look for evidence samples that still exist so that they can be re-examined using more advanced DNA testing. Alan Northrup was 29 years old when he was convicted of rape and sent to prison. He served 17 years before DNA tests exonerated him. Instead of watching his children grow up, he was defending himself against fellow inmates. I had a lot of verbal nasty things said to me in there, you know. And uh, my first year was pretty, pretty scary. I didn't have my friends and all that to, it was like me against everybody. In 70% of DNA exonerations, including Allen's, mistaken eyewitness identification caused the wrongful conviction. Memory is fallible, and it's also subject to post-event suggestions. So it can be shaped by what other witnesses say or by what police officers say during interviews and become something actually very different than the actual event. Studies have also shown that jurors believe eyewitnesses when they testify. When the rape victim gets on the stand and say, says, that's the person who hurt me, and I'm 100% sure, then a jury's going to take that very seriously. The UW School of Law is working toward policy changes to decrease wrongful convictions. That might include a statewide system for preserving DNA and other evidence indefinitely, requiring that police interrogations be recorded, and consistently allowing expert witnesses to testify on the fallibility of eyewitness identification. Having DNA testing done, recording interrogations, preserving evidence is really just making sure that everyone has better and more objective information to decide what really happened in the case. Ted, James, Allen. They paid for others' mistakes with years of their lives. And in Washington State, there's no apology, no compensation for the time they've lost. I didn't even get a good luck, you know, or nothing. The biggest thing for me right now is finding work, uh, because even though I've been exonerated, uh, my record's clean, uh, I still have to explain to any uh, you know, future employer uh, when I fill out an application, I have to explain, well, why there's a 10-year gap in my work history. There are some states and the federal government do have a statute in place to compensate the wrongly convicted. Um, Washington is not one of those states, and so the clients that we have who've been exonerated um, literally have nothing. Um, they struggle every day, and that fight begins the moment you leave prison. That's another thing Lara Zarowski would like to help change. Working on this issue of trying to have some conversations about getting a compensation bill going or talked about getting the conversation going, just having that conversation is creating hope for the men that are that are here now, that are in need of these things, and it's, it's a responsibility, and it's worth fighting for. As for Jackie McMurtry, she remains committed to the project she started so long ago. And I just feel really lucky to be able to do this work. It's hard, um, too, because we've litigated cases and, and lost, or we've started to investigate cases and the evidence doesn't exist anymore, and so that's, that's difficult. But you just have to, have to keep going. And, and certainly having James be you know, exonerated on Christmas Eve and be able to go back to his family and to be able to see Ted and Larry and Alan have those results has been extraordinarily rewarding. 
If you'd like to know more about the Innocence Project Northwest, go to our website, uwtv.org slash uw360 to find links to more information. And now in our next story, we're going to show you some fascinating research at the UW's Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences. It involves brain imaging technology that's helping unlock many of the mysteries about how babies learn. You can step over to Mama. Look at you. We document each step in a child's life because, as any grandmother will tell you, they grow up so fast. Oh, oh. But it may be happening even faster than we thought. At the University of Washington's Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, researchers are studying the amazing potential for learning within babies, using a new state-of-the-art device that looks something like a giant hair dryer. The name of the brain imaging technology is magnetoencephalography. 23-letter word. Thankfully, they've shortened it by calling it MEG or MEG. And it's a breakthrough because it is uh, completely non-invasive. Uh, it doesn't send any signals into the brain, but simply records what's going on in the brain as uh, a brain is working, is doing its work. Dr. Patricia Cool, the co-director of the Institute, says the study of childhood learning used to be reserved for home ec class. But now, it's more like rocket science. Inside the helmet of that hairdryer are uh, 306 squid devices. Those are superconducting quantum interference devices that pick up the very small magnetic fields that are created as thousands of neurons fire. So we can see in the brain with one millimeter accuracy where the activity is going on. Before the MEG, scientists relied on a cap with sensors that recorded the electronic activity that leaked from a baby's brain. It was helpful, but imprecise. Cool says the new MEG technology is like going from still photography to film. What we have here is a data tsunami. You've got this 3D display dancing all over the brain with many areas interacting with one another. Using pictures like these, scientists are learning that the human brain's greatest window of opportunity may come at a time when many parents are barely thinking about preschool, in the first 12 months of life. Cool's group studied nine-month-old children engaged in frequent sessions with Mandarin speakers. After just a month, the American babies were just as good at differentiating sounds in the language as babies of the same age living in China. It's a small window. If they're at 12 months, they can no longer hear the distinctions of a foreign language. At six months, they can. At six months, they're citizens of the world. They can hear all the distinctions. Put me down, said the fish. I do not. Researchers in childhood brain development believe there are similar critical times for learning in other areas, such as math and reading. Just like language, other learning is very potent early in development. Of course, we don't know why memory is so potent during that early period, but that's another reason why we want to get into the brain and see what's happening early that's not happening later. Or what's not happening at all. Detecting the mechanisms for learning in young brains could lead to a greater understanding of developmental disabilities, such as autism and dyslexia, and lead to earlier intervention. I think this rocket science is producing nuggets for parents. I think that when we show that before the babies are producing their first words, it's important that they are engaged by listening to us, and when they do listen to us, their brains are whirring away, taking the statistics and mapping the social cues that we provide. And that is not all I can do, said the cat. Oh, story time's over. The end. Good job. iLabs is currently conducting research on young children with autism as well as their younger siblings in hopes of discovering biomarkers that might help determine which babies are at higher risk for developing the disability. You can find more information at iLabs.Washington.edu or at uwtv.org slash uw360. And when we come back, we'll take you to an exhibit of work by UW art students. There are some very interesting places on campus that you might never see if you didn't know where to look. Student reporter Andrew Mitrak takes us to one of them. Tucked away in the corner of UW's art building is the Jacob Lawrence Gallery. There you go. Come on in. 
Chris Anderson, the gallery's director, showed me through this fall's exhibit. This year it was all or nothing, so the artists had to bring in three works, and either all three got in or none of them did. In a jury show, one piece of work gets in, and you don't really get to know that much about the artist. You can see the individual works, but you don't really get to see the progression or the artist's story. Here we wanted to focus a little bit more on the artist. This is the work of a second year MFA student in photo media named Neil Fryett. There's the three works he submitted are the one that you're seeing right here, which is paper, paste, and then he also did one called soap. Never seen that perspective of how the, the paper rolls, and it's <laughs> interesting looks off kilter. A lot of this series to me is about sort of investigating in slow, sort of painful detail a lot of these sort of mundane tasks that we do. So these six pictures together are one of his three pieces? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, yeah. He, he submitted three series as singular works. Um, his name is Roman Camarda. Um, I believe he's an incoming photo student, but he's also a biology double major. Yeah, it, it seemed like they captured that one very brief moment like when they just get out of the water. It's exactly. exciting. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is Lake Washington, and it's, in, it's late November, so he, you know, uh, this is the artist himself up top. And so he was getting his friends and he's like, just jump in the water and then just act how you would act when you get out. They're all exposed and vulnerable and they're looking directly at you, but it's really funny at the same time too. It's, yeah. <laughs> Except that guy who's like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> that one's funny. I'm listening to his iPod, like in a tree. I really like the, the center one, uh, I think most of all because it's a little more ambiguous in terms of what you're supposed to get out of it. You know, initially you sort of see the hat, but then you get pulled into the details. And you get pulled yeah. into the details of the background. You can keep looking at it and coming back to it and back to it and back to it, and there's still sort of more there. It was asked to me once, why, why come to the University of Washington to get an arts degree? Why not go to an art school or somewhere else? Not only do we provide excellent training in the arts, but you have the opportunity, if you're interested, to seeing how um, the intersections between art and biology, or art and physics, or art and any of those things. Here at a, you know, at a tier one research university like the University of Washington, you have the ability to really reach out and do amazing, dynamic, interdisciplinary works. These are the people that are going to be the next great artists, and you, you really have a chance to see their development and process and see some real vulnerability and, 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 and rawness that you don't necessarily get to see other places, and I think that's great. Seattle attorney Alvin Zients spent 30 years representing Northwest tribes in such landmark cases as the Bolt decision on Indian fishing rights. Our student reporter Kimberly Spaulding talked to him recently about his experiences. Alvin Zients made a lasting impact on the region with his career as a lawyer representing Native American tribes around the Pacific Northwest. For many years, he taught Indian law in what was then the University of Washington's American Indian Studies Center. Now that he has retired, he's finally had the time to publish a memoir recounting his work in a book called A Lawyer in Indian Country. Tell us about what your role was in the Bolt decision. You have to think back to the situation pre-Bolt. It was illegal under Washington law to try to use a net in a river to catch a fish although that was what exactly what the treaties had promised them, that they would have that right. The Bolt case made a huge change because suddenly uh, Indian affairs were on the front pages and people were reading about it and uh, there were demonstrations. It became a civil rights clause. And I'll go a little bit further. The atmosphere in Washington state towards Indians when the fishing rights wars were going on was toxic. Uh, there was a lot of hostility, a lot of bigotry towards Indians, especially in the smaller communities. I was one of the trial lawyers in the Bolt case before Judge Bolt in Tacoma in 1974. The trial was dramatic at times because Indians testified. And I don't think Judge Bolt had ever heard an Indian I don't think he knew anything about Indians. But when they walked up and got up on the witness stand and they began explaining to him what their life was like, it was powerful testimony. And he very, very thoroughly researched 
all the earlier cases and concluded that there was no doubt that these tribes' rights had not been extinguished. They still had these rights, no matter what the state of Washington said. And that the state of Washington had trampled on those rights. Throughout his years in law, Alvin was sure to see a lot of change in the way Indian affairs were handled. He told me about specific changes and the evolution he's seen. Indian tribes have become more governments than tribes. And you can hardly pick up a paper that has an article about water or timber or natural resources without reading that the tribes have something to say about this. The tribes are participants in this democracy. Didn't used to be that way. There's a lot more understanding. I never dreamed I would be doing this sort of thing when I was in law school, but you never know what life has in store for you. The UW School of Law has a history of assisting tribes in Washington State. And in 1999, the Native American Law Center was created. It promotes the development of Indian law, acts as a resource to tribes, and encourages Native American students to attend law school. And coming up next, a program to connect talented young teachers with high-needs students. High-needs schools have a significant number of students who speak English as a second language and who are at or near the poverty level. A partnership between the UW and Seattle Public Schools is focused on improving the learning opportunities available for these students. So how about this rocket? Is that a capital R or a lowercase? There's a unique partnership that's changing the face of education in Washington State. A partnership where public schools get free expert teaching help and where student teachers get instruction and immediately practice what they learn in the classroom. Nice job. This partnership is impacting schools with students who have the highest risk for failure. The University of Washington College of Education, the public schools, and the Ackerley Foundation have come together to create opportunity and new hope for thousands of high-needs students. The teacher education program at the University of Washington is a program that prepares both secondary and elementary candidates. We prepare approximately 60 candidates every year that are certified as teachers and also receive a master's degree from the University of Washington. Marina Pita is a student in the teacher education program. Marina spends time in classes at the university, but also spends many hours at Concord Elementary School, learning from UW faculty and working with students. It's one of 22 schools in the Ackerley Partnership. Being in the program is very intense. Um, that's the word a lot of people use. It's, it's a full-time job, really, is what it is. Um, all the time you're always thinking about teaching and I swear sometimes my best ideas come right when I'm falling asleep or right when I'm waking up and I'm thinking about what's going to happen. Exactamente, tienen razón. Teaching is always on your mind in this program. Miss Marina or I could come around and check your spelling. An endowment from the Ackerley Foundation puts University of Washington teacher education students like Marina in high needs schools. The philosophy is that student teachers who work in high-needs schools will be better prepared to teach in any school. And we had learned uh, through our research that a lot of new teachers want to teach in high-risk schools. You know, they come in with a passion. It's kind of like having eyes. Yet they're not given the support and the tools they need to succeed, and they end up dropping out or leaving those high-risk schools after a couple of years. What it's doing is bringing the students at, from the university out into the school so that they're getting a first-hand experience of what it really is like to be a teacher. This is our fourth lesson with this group. One of the innovative aspects of the program is on-site literacy training. UW teaching education students are paired with elementary students to help them learn to read. Afterwards, they review their teaching strategies. And your use of the clues and repeating the clues I thought it was incredibly effective. Ah, dijo la tele que va a nevar. The TV said it's going to snow here. We want to develop what, what we call thoughtfully adaptive expert teachers who have the subject matter knowledge, knowledge of children, knowledge of development, and actually can take that knowledge and use it flexibly as they're observing students' strengths and weaknesses. Marina is a fluent speaker of Spanish and a recipient of a fellowship from the Edgar and Holly Martinez Foundation. 
at Concord, she's able to help students learn to read in their native language. They know from Spanish. You can tell their background knowledge of Spanish comes out in learning English. We're trying to deal with the issue of literacy by building on children's first language. So we're giving them more time to build up that second language and at the same time honouring their first language, honouring their culture, honouring what's familiar to them. Does everybody agree to make it red? Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay. When Marina is done with the school day, she works at the YMCA with students from the school. The idea is to get to know the students in a different context outside of the classroom. So we decided that one of the things we wanted candidates to learn was to think about how kids learn in and out of school, how to connect with families, how to build relationships with parents. Well, we have a Puerto Rican group that comes in and plays music and they dance and this is not something you know you do every day in class. So you get to see who these kids really are outside of school. Students like Marina are receiving the best preparation possible to teach in high-need schools. The partnership between the University of Washington and the Ackerley Public Schools Network is a model that is sustainable, a model for success. My experience with Marina is she's just very perceptive about kids. She gets to know who they are and where they're coming from and then sets high expectations for where she wants to get them. And that's so beneficial for their learning and it shows that she's going to make a great teacher. I love everything about teaching. Uh, I guess the best moments, those, those key moments are those aha moments. And that's what I live for, is when kids make a connection. I want to go to the UW when I grow up. Excellent. After graduation, Marina is committed to teaching for three years in Washington State High Needs Schools, a plan she looks forward to. She says she wants to continue helping kids who need it the most. And as always, you can find a link to more information about the teacher education program and other stories on our website, uwtv.org slash uw360. You can watch this episode again online, and we'll be back next month with all new stories. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in February.